Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our first program of the year at the World Affairs Council of Philadelphia. As we get started tonight, I'm honored to pass the mic, the virtual mic that is, over, Mar over to Margot Deli Caprini, the Chancellor at Penn State Abington, our partner for this evening's event. Margot? Thank you. Um, good evening, everyone, and welcome. My name is Margot Deli Carpini, and I am the Chancellor at Penn State University, Abington. I'd like to thank you all for joining us for tonight's webinar, How a New Generation of Leaders Will Transform America, featuring a discussion with Charlotte Alter, senior correspondent at Time and author of a recent book titled, The Ones We've Been Waiting For. As an educational institution, Penn State Abington is highly invested in the next generation of local, national, and global leaders. And we're inspired every day by the ingenuity, diversity, and determination we see in our students. And we're delighted to support and participate in this positive and forward-thinking conversation about our collective future. We're proud to collaborate with the World Affairs Council of Philadelphia in their mission of bringing global education and civil discourse through conversations like these to Philadelphians of all ages. Inclusion and access are core tenets of our goals as educators at Penn State Abington. And we strongly agree with the council's credo that democracy demands discourse and everyone deserves a seat at that table. As the new chancellor at Penn State Abington, I was pleased to learn about the partnership that our campus has formed with the council. The work that the council does in developing the next generation of globally engaged thinkers, leaders, and citizens through education and their focus on creating opportunities for informed and respectful public discourse are very much aligned with the educational mission that is at our core. At Penn State Abington, we work to provide high impact global learning and engagement opportunities for our students. And we work to internationalize our curriculum and our initiatives. Our strategic goals include expanding global education and international learning opportunities for our students. In addition to the partnership that currently exists between the council and Penn State Abington, I'm excited to explore additional ways that we can expand our work together and meet our mutual goals of preparing the next generation of professionals, leaders, and globally engaged citizens. So again, welcome and thank you for attending tonight's webinar. I'm going to now turn it back over to Lauren Schwartz, who is the president and CEO of the World Affairs Council of Philadelphia, who you just met so we can begin tonight's event. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Margo. Thanks to you and all of our partners over at Penn State Abington for being the education sponsor for today's event. We are deeply appreciative of your commitment to the Council's mission and our shared mission, it sounds like, of bringing global education and civil discourse to Philadelphians of all ages and backgrounds, especially those students up on your campus. This ongoing partnership allows us to bring programs like this to not only the students in the community, but learners of all ages across the country. And tonight I'm delighted to launch another season of speaker events for the World Affairs Council of Philadelphia. Believe it or not, we've been doing this for 70 years and the council has brought our community fresh, nonpartisan and civil discourse on critical issues affecting the world. And now our reach has expanded virtually just like yours has across the country throughout the pandemic. And we thank you for joining us from your homes, your dorm rooms, your cars, your walking around the block and offices and wherever you may find yourself this evening. We do hope to reignite in-person programming once again when it's safe and we get to see you all in person. But in the meantime, the council remains committed to unique and thought-provoking informational discussions and context like tonight's. I'd like to offer a special welcome to some of the high school students and college students and teachers who participate in the council's education programs throughout the year. We work with over 2,500 middle schoolers and high schoolers across 85 schools annually as the leading provider of foreign affairs education in this region. These students are not just the leaders of our future, but they're leading right now. I'm gonna hear a lot more about that concept from Charlotte shortly. If you have technical issues using the program or you'd like to send questions for the speaker, Charlotte, we've already got questions coming in, so get ready. Please use the chat or questions function and the council's vice president of programs, Haley Boyle, will help you and get the questions to me. We'll get to as many of them as we can. And now I'd like to briefly introduce our guest tonight. We are delighted to welcome Charlotte Alter, who is the senior correspondent at Time, covering politics and social issues. She has covered the 2016, 2018, and 2020 campaigns. I'm pretty sure you can hear my children right now. Welcome to the Young Leaders of Tomorrow. In any case, Charlotte has covered the 2016, 2018, and 2020 campaigns. 
the Women's March, anti-Trump resistance, the rise in youth activism, which is happening right outside of my door, are around a variety of topics, including climate change and gun violence, and the spread of conspiracy theories and disinformation. And of course, she covered the 2020 Democratic primary and the general election. Her work has appeared not just in Time, but in the New York Times, the Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, and Vox. Charlotte is also the author of tonight's featured book. It's called The Ones We've Been Waiting For, How a New Generation of Leaders Will Transform America. If you'd like to purchase a signed copy of this book following the event, please drop a note in the chat before ending the webinar or reach out to us by email using info at wacfilla.org. I did read the book over the weekend and I can say that you will not be disappointed. Charlotte provides a compelling look at the structures, identity and ethos for today's leaders transforming our country. You'll get to know the newcomers shaping today's political landscape with a fresh lens. We'll start with some brief opening remarks from Charlotte next, followed by a moderated discussion and then, with, and then end with questions and answers from you, our audience. Charlotte, welcome, the floor is yours. unmute myself unmute myself cool great start <laughs> uh lauren thank you so much for having me margo thank you so much for for uh for for having me at this program for making all of this possible um i it's really a joy to be here with all of you even though we're in this weird new virtual world where everyone's homes in the background um but i i'm you know, this, this book is about the looming generational turnover uh, that is already transforming American politics and is, and is only poised to have even more of an impact as this new generation rises into political power, both as voters and as leaders. I mean, uh, this, is a, this is a generational turnover on the horizon, but it's also a generational turnover that's happening right now. Um, even just on January 6th, John Ossoff became the first millennial in the Senate. Um, last year, we had a millennial running for president, Pete Buttigieg. We actually had two millennials running for president. Uh, Pete, Pete Buttigieg and Tulsi Gabbard uh, were both millennial uh, presidential candidates. Um, and so, you know, part of what I argue in this book is that um, uh, right now, our government uh, is heavily tilted towards the baby boomers and the silent generation. Uh, Biden, President Biden is our oldest first term president. President Trump uh, was our oldest first term president until President Biden was elected. Um, and so we have a government in which people born in the 1930s and 40s are heavily overrepresented compared to the rest of the general population. And younger people, millennials, but also uh, Gen X and Gen Z um, are, are actually fairly underrepresented. And that imbalance is very likely to change over the next uh, five to 10 years. So I wrote this book as a way to kind of give people a glimpse as to what that change might look like and how our politics might shift when a new generation uh, kind of more fully inhabits their place in the American political system. And that's already happening. Very good. Thank you, Charlotte. It's um, a lot to think about when you say it that way. All of a sudden, <laughs> it seems so obvious, right, that there's this um, the imbalance in terms of generational representation in, in our demographics. So yeah, and, and um, sorry, no, and on that note, you know, uh, one thing that people say to me is like, you know, well, how are you sure this is going to happen? And I'm kind of like, well, show me your time machine. And then I will, you know, it's just like, like, it is, this is, these are the laws of physics and biology. When you have people uh, in their late 70s, 80s, approaching their 90s, you know, Dianne Feinstein is set to be in office uh, into her 90s. Um, that's not a sustainable political situation. So uh, this, this turnover is inevitable. Uh, people are already beginning to retire. Um, and uh, this book is about what comes next. Very good. And, and we can imagine that when you wrote this book, which came out about a year ago, 
you also didn't have a time machine or a crystal ball to foresee what would be coming in the year that will perhaps just be known as 2020. Uh, there was no perfect vision into that, but, but what a crazy set of challenges we've all faced. Pandemic, recession, racial justice, climate change, insurrection, major disruptions in everything we do, travel, business, education, right? It, it's just been monumental in every way. And so how do you think our younger leaders will face the challenges before our world, not only in politics, but in activist circles in the tech industry that we see rising in importance and also political pressure? Are there advantages that these young leaders have that better equip them to tackle this menagerie of challenges facing the world? I think there are certain advantages that some of these younger leaders have, including um, a really deep understanding of how the internet actually works. Um, you know, uh, I, I say that um, it, in my book, I call millennials the last dinosaurs because one day far in the future, millennials will be the last people alive on earth who remember what life was like before the internet. Um, everybody who came after millennials will have grown up from birth with the internet being a part of their life. Uh, millennials are sort of like the first digital natives and the last people who will really remember what it was like before then. Um, so I think that that's a huge advantage. I also think in a lot of ways, and this is part of what I try to chronicle in this book, um, in a lot of ways, the last 20 years have been um, characterized by a crumbling of a lot of the faith in some of the institutions that once um, anchored our entire society, really. I mean, and I go through it in the book, but um, you know, just a couple of examples. Um, the, you know, many people saw the, the war in Iraq and Afghanistan and the failures around 9-11 um, as, uh, as an example of the failure of the foreign policy establishment. Um, the financial crisis was a failure of the financial establishment. Um, many people perceived, on both sides of the aisle, perceived the election of Donald Trump to be a failure of the political establishment. And so this is a generation that has uh, lived through these failures of the institutions that their parents really counted on to kind of anchor their anchor this free and safe society that we live in. Um, and, you know, on the one hand, that's been incredibly destabilizing, um, you know, aside from those major failures, I think nearly every millennial's life is characterized by the sort of broader economic failure um, of, uh, of, you know, it, of um, private corporations, it, sort of jobs no longer providing what jobs once provided. Um, in the middle of the 20th century, you could be a, um, you know, a, a, a worker without a college degree and support a family of four on a single income because uh, companies were paying their workers um, in a way that would allow a family to survive on a single income. Now that's no longer the case. Uh, in the 1980s, uh, it was very common for people to have health insurance from their jobs. Now work structure has changed in such a way where a lot of people work in the gig economy. A lot of people are cobbling together consulting gigs or part-time gigs. Not every company provides health insurance. So things that were once assumed to be taken care of by the private sector are no longer guaranteed. So on the one hand, that's destabilizing. On the other hand, it also creates a lot of opportunity for millennials and other, other young leaders to really rethink a lot of these structures and try to come up with something better. Yes, absolutely. I, when I've had this conversation with other folks and tried to explain millennials from my perspective, I say they were the first generation that grew up with school shootings, right? School is no longer a safe place. Um, your peers are no longer safe. And then you've watched, you've lived through a, an outsized number of recession and you've watched your parents or your grandparents climb and climb and try and try and work and work and the bottom drops out. And that caused you to be able to not go to college or have to drop out and work in addition to 9-11 being one of your first major formative memories and being out, the country being at war your entire life. 
this is a very different American experience, uh, which isn't to say that the baby boomers had, had a simple American experience either. It was no storybook, but um, it, it's a very volatile time to grow up. But I think that makes them potentially agents for change, which sometimes is perceived as being changing too quickly, being flip, being disloyal, being um, sort of, you know, vagabonds <laughs> wanting to travel, work just enough to travel the world. But the, the distrust that they that we perceive millennials to have is rooted in some of these deals with society as young as kindergartners being shot and the things that they've lived through being a, a real part of their identity. Exactly. And and I think that's Lauren, I think you I think that's really well put. Um, and you know, one of the things that I learned in researching this book, which really anchors um, the point here, is that um, you know, a lot of times people assume that young people are always liberal and older people are always conservative and everybody just starts off like a hippie and then just gets more conservative as they age. Um, and that may be true along the margins a little bit. You know, people tend to maybe get a tiny bit more conservative about their taxes or maybe they start to care more about their property values as they like go through life and buy a home and have a family and, you know, begin to experience the things that might pull somebody's politics to the right. But actually, uh, social scientists have said that that's largely a myth and that in fact, people's, uh, people's political attitudes are largely formed uh, in early adulthood in response to the events that they're experiencing in the world, roughly between the ages of 16 and 24. So what my book does is it goes through the events that millennials had experienced roughly between those ages from 9-11 uh, up through the rise of Donald Trump and you know, the, the subsequent events that happened after that when millennials actually really started to begin participating in the political system as electeds. Um, but what's important to remember about that is that you, know, you can really look back throughout history um, and 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 you know, I talked to a, a social scientist who said that you know one of the ways to look at these trend lines when you look at um, you know at people's support for the the popularity of the different parties is what was happening when those people were young, and in general, people tend to uh, uh, popular presidents tend to attract young people to their party and unpopular presidents tend to repel young people from their party. So for example, a lot of people who were young in the 1980s, I mean, uh, Ronald Reagan won a lot of young voters. He was a very popular president. Uh, people thought that he did a great job. And um, a lot of people who were young in the 1980s are still conservative because they formed their identities in reaction to the Reagan years. Um, the same is true for Eisenhower another very popular Republican president who attracted a lot of younger people to his party. But then Richard Nixon, uh, only maybe 15, mm, yeah, only like a decade or so, uh, 13 years after Eisenhower, um, repelled a lot of young people from his party because he was a very unpopular Republican president. So that's one way to look at these trend lines and why uh, why it's important to look at people's political um, attitudes in the context of what was happening when they were young. Uh, that's an interesting perspective when you take a look at the boomers too, you know, they're less conservative and grew up in different times and they're often the parents of millennials. So that's, that has some authenticity to it just from a sort of gut reaction. But let's stay on this topic of the young are not just liberal and the old are not just conservative. In, in current times, we'll take the example of the insurrection at the Capitol, which many of course say was encouraged by the president at the time, Donald Trump, leader of the Republican party and, and a massive conservative movement. However, influential young lawmakers like Republican Senator Hawley, Representative Lauren Boebert, Representative Matt Goetz, they fueled the fire of this conservative movement by echoing what now seem to be baseless claims about voting fraud and election corruption. They tweeted the locations of their fellow members of Congress during the insurrection and more. 
And so there is often this assumption, which you just touched on, that younger people are more liberal and take on disruptor roles. But we see with these three examples of young conservative Republican lawmakers really towing the Republican Party line. So do you think that they're disruptors because the movement they are trying to support in President Trump's rhetoric is disruptive? Or are they falling in line with party leadership and conservatism? fantastic question. And it's one of the things that has been, it's one of the really uh, interesting kind of complexities of this generation, generational research. So I absolutely think that these young Republicans are disruptors. Of course they are. Um, they uh, are using all the same technologies, they're using all the same strategies to communicate with their base that Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez is using. Um, so they are in many ways the conservative iteration of that form of sort of social media fueled politics, which is very much how the next generation of leaders is going to communicate with their constituents. Um, here's kind of the, the way I think about this. Absolutely, there are many, many young conservatives. Um, Millennials and Gen Z are not all liberal by any stretch of the imagination. However, it's not 50-50. It's, um, it's not evenly, the, these, these younger generations, millennials and Gen Z are not evenly divided between, between Democrats and Republicans. They skew heavily towards Democrats. They are more liberal than their parents by nearly every available metric. They have not um, gone through, um, you know, they, they uh, one of the ways that people measure social conservatism is um, organized religion, marriage, and children. Those are all things that these younger generations are delaying later and later if they're doing them at all. So um, I think it's kind of important to keep two things in your head at the same time. On the one hand, there are um, many high profile young Republicans who are very good, who are certainly going to be around for a long time. Um, in no way am I arguing that uh, the that there's going to be just sort of like a um, that everyone young is a Democrat and that the Republican Party is just going to go away when the older people are no longer uh, dominating the electorate. Um, but what I am arguing is that both young Democrats and young Republicans are going to be doing things in a little bit of a different way than their elders did. Um, and some of those things uh, may be unifying. For example, um, I don't think, you know, Lauren Boebert or Marjorie Taylor Greene or Matt Gates um, or, or Josh Hawley are good examples of this. But there are there is a sort of um, conservative climate movement of young people who uh, are politically conservative and they you know uh, they still believe in climate change. They believe they understand the science behind climate change. They understand that humans are responsible and they want a sort of conservative uh, market based solution to that problem. Um, so that's one area where I think, you know, student debt is another area where conservatives, um, you know, understand it's a problem. They have different ideas for a solution. But um, the way I kind of think about it is young Democrats and young Republicans, with some very big exceptions, you know, for example, you know, some of the young Republicans who are identified with the QAnon movement definitely do not fall into this framework that I'm talking about, right? Um, but in general, there are areas where young Democrats and young Republicans can agree on what the problems are, but they disagree on what the solutions are. So for example, they may think, uh, they may think that, in, that um, climate change is a much bigger problem than Senator Jim Inhofe, who's 80 years old and brought a snowball onto the floor of the Senate to argue that climate change isn't real. Like, I, I don't think that, that most young Republicans are gonna do that. In fact, the, da the data shows that young Republicans under that, that as a whole, young Republicans understand that climate change is real. The problem right now in our 
political, weird kind of insurrectionist political situation we're in is that we have several very high profile um, young Republican members of Congress who are actually very unrepresentative of their generation. They are much more representative of this kind of baby boomer, um, uh, this, this, this baby boomer resentment that um, Donald Trump really uh, tapped into. And one of the ways you know that's true is because if you look at the, um, at the results of the 2020 election, young people voted against Trump by 25 points. So it's not really accurate to say like, you know, that there's an equal and opposite conservative reaction to um, the sort of rise in political engagement on the left. There is a lot of, pol of millennial political engagement on the right, but it is of a different, it is in some ways like less representative of the generation as a whole, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. All right, uh, let's take a look at, at it's, a it's hard. It's hard to like, it's kind of just, it, it's it's hard to, um, it, it, it is a really complicated nut to crack. And it's something yeah. that I thought a lot about while I was writing this book. Yeah, which is one of the reasons why the book is, is needed, right? It, it, it doesn't oversimplify. It's not a headline or a tweet or something. It, it's a complex issue that you can't just put labels on. Yeah. So let's let's take a step back and take a world view on the topic of young leaders and shifting demographics. Well, we think of millennials here in the United States as, as the young people. Uh, emerging economies have much younger average ages. For example, the average age in Nigeria is only 18. That's the average. Pakistan, 22. Here in the U.S., the average age is 38. The oldest millennial is about 38, 39 years old. In Germany, average age is 45. And in Japan, it's 48. Can you share with us a sense of similar trends of young leaders in other countries and their impacts around the world? And as a, a second piece of that, with emerging economies being so young and fast growing, so their, their impact and, and presence in the world would be felt much more strongly. How does our country's changing leadership demographic help or hinder what you see as the future of foreign relations? It's a great, it's a great question. So, you know, uh, definitely there are other countries who are doing this better than we are. Um, Jacinda Ardern in, uh, in New Zealand has, is a, I believe she's 40. She's the prime minister of New Zealand. She's done an incredible job tackling COVID. Um, uh, Sana Marin is the prime minister of Finland, F Finland, and she is the youngest uh, world leader. Um, sorry, youngest head of state, I, I believe it was. Uh, last year, she became the youngest ever head of, not yet, ever, because there's queens and stuff who've been like eight. But um, uh, she's, the, she's the youngest head of state right now. Um, and, uh, and, you know, she's done some really incredible stuff around paid family leave and childcare in that country. So um, I think it's, you know, I'm always a little bit wary of comparing apples and apples, um, you know, co co comparing leadership styles, um, because not only are different countries so different in their challenges and their um, opportunities and their resources, but they're also just different in their leadership structures. I mean, the way American politics is set up is very different than the way the political system is set up in New Zealand, for example, or in Finland or in Germany. Uh, or in the UK, to, for that matter. Um, so I think it's, you know, it says something about, um, let, me re let me rephrase this, but I think it says something about how broken our system is that our political leadership has not caught up with, with the times in the way that um, it has in other countries. I mean, it's, we in some ways almost did a kind of like, like we almost went in reverse. We had Obama who really seemed like he was a big leap forward generationally. I mean, he was a young president uh, in his early forties. He was supported overwhelmingly by young people. It was a youth quake that elected Barack Obama. And then after Barack Obama, 
we again, we, we, it, it was a there was a there was an old lash and a white lash to Barack Obama with Donald Trump. Um, and of course, the racial element of this cannot be overstated. Um, and this is one reason why I think it's actually really difficult to compare the politics in the United States to the politics of other countries, because the United States has um, our politics are in many ways defined by racial politics and the way race manifests itself in the American political system is fairly unique because we have this unique history of chattel slavery and uh, and it and um, it it is it has dominated our political discourse in a way that's very specific to this country um, and I think that you saw that in the election of Trump. And I think you saw that in the election of Biden. Um, but I do think that the United States is going to have to modernize and is going to have to kind of put a fresher face out to the world um, if we're going to keep up with some of these developing economies that um, where not only the people, but also the leaders seem to be kind of innovating and disrupting and growing faster than we are. Right. We had the ambassador of Estonia just before the election, and he was talking about he's now very high up in the foreign ministry, also a young, younger diplomat, although quite, quite accomplished. And he was talking about their digital citizen sort of identification card and how they vote online in like 30 seconds and it takes 10 minutes to pay your taxes. And of course, there's lots of things around trust and being a smaller place and having overcome communist style and having to read, you know, there's lots of reasons why that worked there. But I think about Estonians coming here and looking around and saying like, what are you doing? Why are you still using all of this paper? Why exactly. are you faxing me things? And right. if, if something as small as that, you know, you imagine like, uh, we'll, we can take, we, we, I won't bring the UN into this, but a big multilateral and multinational organization you know, the, the technology and the innovation and the speed with which different generations will approach work and collaboration in an ever globalizing world. Um, some of these things will play out in a very practical way, but will also affect reputation and identity of a given country. I think that's a really great point. And, you know, I've also heard about the Estonia um, sort of online citizenship uh, feature, basically. Mm -hmm. And it sounds it sounds like what a 21st century democracy should be doing. Um, and and one, um, one, frankly, one reason that I think the United States is behind, um, th that our government is behind technologically, even if our, even if our economy isn't, is because, um, you know, we are the home of Facebook. We are the, we are the home, home of Google. Google. We are the home of YouTube. Um, American inventors uh, created the most um, powerful companies on the internet. And yet our government um, until recently has been dominated by people who don't understand the, these companies and don't understand the power that they have. I have a chapter in my book that is called um, Senator We Sell Ads because that was what Mark Zuckerberg had to say to a Senate Oversight Committee interviewing him about Facebook's impact on the 2016 election because the senators who were sitting on the committee tasked with regulating Facebook didn't understand the basic business model of the company. So I think that that's actually a great example of how having this kind of um, geriatric ossified leadership has held the United States government back from fully utilizing this inc these incredible uh, technological innovations that are being developed in this country and not actually being used to strengthen our democracy, in fact, seem to be having a sort of corrosive effect on our democracy because the government can't figure out how to regulate it and utilize it properly. Mm -hmm. And so let's pull this thread into the more topics around social media and sort of nation state lists, active activism and movements. So let's talk about activist circles. We know that politics does play out far beyond borders and elected offices and, and official politics. And we've seen so many young people in this country get involved in movements like Black Lives Matter, 
here, but also around the world in solidarity movements. There's climate change focused movements like the Sun Sunrise Movement. And then we've seen solidarity, not just with Black Lives Movement, Black Lives, um, Black Lives Matter here and in other countries, but the reverse too, right? Solidarity with the NSARS movement in Nigeria and solidarity here among young people and around the world with activists to support the democratic uh, movements in Hong Kong. There are just a couple of examples, but there are so many more. And a lot of these movements, most of them are very low hierarchy. And they, they appear to be leaderless. And, and sometimes we, we think that they actually are just leaderless. Is that tied, or let me say, how is that tied to elements of millennial culture? And how are generations shaping these messaging and methods of these movements with their different approach? Yeah, I mean, I think that this is in some ways the single most important thing to understand about um, how the rising generation experiences politics. Um, because the movement, the political movements um, powered by millennials and Gen Z are, you know, are largely leaderless, they are largely horizontal, and they are largely networked, because in many ways they resemble they they take their form from the social networks that enable them to exist. Um, mm -hmm. They uh, they kind of mirror their platform in some ways. So, uh, for example, I interviewed um, you know some of the leaders, some of the originators of the Black Lives Matter movement. They wouldn't even necessarily call themselves leaders, but they originated the movement, and they said that Twitter is their text. Twitter is their kind of foundation that they um, built the movement on. Um, and I think that this can be in some ways really confusing for people. And I even have had this experience, you know, covering these movements where my editors will say some version of like, well, who's Martin Luther King Jr.? Like, you know, where's Malcolm X? Like, show me Gloria Steinem. Like, who's, who's in charge? Like, let's interview them. And it's, not that simple because both everybody is in charge and nobody is in charge. And um, that is a structure that has a lot of um, advantages, but it also has a lot of disadvantages. I mean, or several disadvantages. The advantages are um, it enables, it's very empowering It enables anybody to get involved on any level. There are no gatekeepers. Um, all voices matter. Um, you know, it, in fact, one uh, one way to understand this is to even think about the rhetoric of these movements and how that's changed from 50 or 60 years ago. Think about Martin Luther King Jr. One of the iconic lines that we remember him saying is, I have a dream, one man's dream. He said that on the National Mall a singular figure standing in front of a sea of thousands of people. Think about the lines that we um, that we uh, associate with these movements in the 21st century. Black Lives Matter. Um, Me too. That is a that's a that is a collective expression. Um, I'm trying to think of some others. I'm, I'm like blanking right now, but I, I, I went through a lot of them in my, in my book. The point is that um, 21st century social movements powered by millennials and Gen Z are much more collective than 20th century social movements had been. The way I think about it is um, in the 20th century, uh, activism, not all activism, but political power was kind of drawn in portraiture. It would be like, here's a great man. Maybe there's three great men. And then like, here's a great woman and like, here are a couple others, but there's like two or three or five, there's not 5 million. Um, and I end in the 21st century, the power that had once been drawn in portraiture is now kind of pixelated. I think about it almost like those Chuck Close paintings where it's hundreds or thousands of individual people all saying the same thing at the same time. Um, if you've ever been to one of these protests, you've probably heard the people's mic which is when you know there's a big crowd of people and anybody can stand up and say you know mic check and then everyone around them says mic check and they say something like we're marching down fifth avenue and everyone says we're marching down fifth avenue that is a physical manifestation of 
how these messages spread on social media. That's a in-person retweet. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, and so I think that that's, you know, so on the one hand, that's tremendously powerful as we've seen in the movement for racial justice, as we've seen in the movement against sexual assault and sexual harassment, as we've seen in the movement for climate uh, justice, um, as we've seen in the, oh, I, I remember one of the other phrases, we are the 99%. What could mm -hmm. get more collective than that? Think about we are the 99% versus I have a dream. One is about, is about an idea originating from one man. The other is about sort of a collective cry of outrage from 99% of people. Um, mm -hmm. But the but the the downsides of that are also real. Um, it and we saw this, I think, particularly this summer with the racial justice movement over the summer, because while it was tremendously powerful and tremendously impactful and changed um, um, changed many Americans' awareness of systemic racism, uh, there were also um, moments where the movement lacked discipline. And mm -hmm. there were people who were able to hijack um, the sort of the legitimate grievances of the movement and, you know, bad actors were able to kind of infiltrate or, uh, you know, go overboard and break windows or destroy property, you know, things that ended up triggering a backlash against this racial justice movement. Um, and the, the way to understand that is, listen, you know, uh, when Dr. King and SNCC were organizing their uh, activism in the South in the 1950s and 60s, they were able to say, our people are the ones who marched in the streets. That guy breaking a window, he's not with us. You know, mm -hmm. that's not what well, our movement is this. Um, he's not part of that. We're here because because there were leaders, they were able to define who is part of their movement and who was not. Um, many of those activists were extremely well trained to deal with police, to deal with dogs, to deal with all of the violence that was coming at them as they, at, as they you know, marched for racial justice mm -hmm. in that time. Um, now with this tremendous uprising, there's tremendous power there, but it also means that there are people who can kind of take that mantle and do whatever they want with it. And then that can be twisted in a way that reflects badly on the movement. And there's not a singular leader to say, you know, we don't stand for that. We stand for this, but not for that. We, um, we behave this way, we don't behave that way. Um, and so it kind of can create a chaotic, um, some chaotic messaging around what is actually a very simple demand. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. That was a long um, answer. Sorry about that. <laughs> another complex question. Yeah. So we have a tremendous amount of questions coming in from our audience, Charlotte. Uh, the first two are special. We always uh, start our questions with our panelists or our speakers with students from the Philadelphia area who are studying here, who are engaged in world affairs. And so first we'll go to uh, Jalay Brown Gilliam, who is a 10th grader from Girard College, a high school student here in Philadelphia. And we'll have that question first for you. Hey, Jalei. Hi, thanks for having me and speaking with me tonight. Um, so my question is, I know that you stated earlier that you believe that the youth of today are changing their minds and starting to become, I'll say like more open-minded, but do you think that given the previous example of quote unquote leadership, that youth are today are prepared to lead America. Or Sorry, can you just repeat that America? last part? I, I didn't hear that last thing you said. Do you think that the youth or the next generation are prepared or influenced correctly to lead America? That's a great question, Jalei. Thank you for thank you for asking that. Um, I do think I do think that young people are prepared. I mean, I think that, um, you know, millennials and Gen Z, for example, are, well, millennials were the most racially diverse generation in American history until Gen Z came along and then they were more racially diverse. So um, 
the point of saying that is just that like the world that millennials and Gen Z are inheriting is also the world that they grew up in. They are of the modern world in a way that people uh, who were born in the 1930s and 40s are not. Um, so in some ways, I would almost ask, could somebody who's 80 years old, is somebody who's 80 years old prepared to lead in a world uh, that is so defined uh, by the conditions of the 21st century? Um, you know, can, can somebody who grew up in the 1950s and 60s truly understand um, the very specific urgencies of this moment? Um, so to, so, you know, Jalay, one of the reasons I'm so excited that you asked this question is that I actually think that young people are uniquely prepared to lead in this moment because they understand more deeply um, the very specific challenges that are facing Americans right now. They understand more deeply the challenges around climate change. They understand more deeply the challenges around racial justice. They understand more deeply the economic inequality that has really divided Americans over the last 20 years. Um, people who grew up, who um, are cushioned by that 20th century economic stability um, might not have that understanding. So I think one of the things that's really exciting about seeing so many young people get involved with activism and get it and beginning to run for office and beginning to take themselves seriously uh, as political, as participants in our democracy. You know, one thing I want to remind everybody based on Jalay's question is you don't have to run for office to be a participant in American democracy. You can march, you can vote. You can be somebody who just is a is somebody who pays attention and watches the news and reads the news and has an informed opinion of of uh, of what our leaders should be doing. That's a, that's a very very important way to participate in democracy. So I think that young people are uniquely able to participate in the 21st century democracy as it is now. So thank you so much for that, Jalai. That was a great question. That's a great setup of an answer to our next student question from Elliot Copeland. He's the president of the Student Government Association at Penn State Abington, already in a leadership role here at Penn State. And he's got our next student question for you. Hey, Elliot. Hi, Charlotte. Thank you, Lauren. I appreciate you guys having me here. Um, I thought this was a very interesting discussion. And I wanted to hear a little bit more about, OK, you've done the research into how millennials organize. How do you think my generation, Generation Z, will, as we, we move out of college, as we move into the workforce and into our professional lives, how do you think we'll organize? You know, that's a fantastic question. Um, and to be totally honest with you, I don't know yet. Um, and, and I don't think that it's necessarily clear yet. Um, I think that uh, this, past year that we've had with COVID is going to be something, you know, my book is about the major events that have defined millennial young adulthood, 9-11, the financial crisis, Barack Obama's election, the rise of tech, new, new technologies. Um, COVID and the Trump presidency and the last really four years um, are going to be those events for Gen Z. And uh, I can say with absolute certainty that Gen Z will remember COVID for the rest of their lives and that this pandemic and the government's response to it um, is going to be a focal point of how Gen Z orients its political attitudes. I don't yet know what that orientation will be because it hasn't sort of played out yet. Um, I do think there are a couple trends that we're already seeing that um, I expect to continue. Um, Gen Z, like millennials, maybe even more than millennials, are extremely um, are extremely active in demanding racial justice. Um, that's an extremely central tenant of Gen Z political activism. Um, Gen Z also cares a lot about climate change. 
maybe even is more radical in their solutions to climate change than millennials are because many millennials you know while they've always cared about climate change sort of might have come up a little earlier back when everyone thought like oh if you turn off the lights like that'll help <laughs> um and i also think that um you know in in my book i point out i point to pete Buttigieg and alexandria ocasio cortez as sort of like the two poles of like the different styles of millennial leadership pete Buttigieg is a little bit more like buttoned up and AOC is a little bit more about utilizing, you know, utilizing social media to really kind of generate a movement. And I would guess that Gen Z is maybe a little bit more um, in the AOC model uh, than the Pete Buttigieg model. But honestly, Elliot, I would be really curious to hear what you think. You probably know better than I um, how that how Gen Z is going to sort of take what they've been given and use it to create a new conception of what they want out of their government. I, um, I wish I had some special insight. Um, I, I only know what I have, uh, what I've learned by observing my peers at Penn State Abington. Um, I, I have seen the, the reflections of, uh, of racial justice being important. It's obviously something which is important to me, um, but also just if I picked any one of the random 3,700 or so students at our campus, I'm sure that's something that they would say is important to them too. Um, I don't know. It feels to me like, is it a, an organizing model based off of, of text messages and signal and social media. Um, that seems likely to me right now, but I don't know whether or not that's just because everybody's in college and this is how we meet each other or how that will change. Yeah. Well, but, you know, Elliot, I think this is important because, listen, some things change and some don't, right? Um, so uh, you have, for example, you have, um, this is actually a great example. You have organizers who uh, started organizing with sort of activist groups on social media, then got into the political space, maybe with a member of Congress or a you know Senate candidate or something. Then those those organizers became staffers for the Joe Biden campaign, which had to run entirely online last year because of the pandemic. And now many of those same staffers, many of that same team um, is bringing those technical skills into the White House, into the White House digital office. So um, that's what I mean when I say some of the skills and strategies that people are using now far outside the White House, nowhere close to Washington, not like in the inner sanctum, those percolate into our political system People learn from them, people trade tips and swap strategies, and then they end up actually being something that defines how the president communicates with the public. So um, I think this is, you know, it remains to be seen exactly what the takeaways of all this are going to be, but it's definitely going to be important. All right, so, Charlotte, we only have 34 more questions in seven minutes. No, <laughs> I'm kidding. Oh my God. Uh, we do have quite a few questions. And so I'm going to merge a couple and maybe you can do some sort of rapid fire instinct. Yeah, responses. I'll try to be shorter. Sorry. Yeah. Well, that's a complicated subject. Okay. We have a question from Mitch Sargent, who's a longtime friend of the council. He says, do you think this change of leadership to millennials and Generation X could lead to a successful third party weakening both the Republicans and Democratic parties that infuses populism into it? Yes. Do you want me to answer more? Let's keep I mean, going. All right. I, I, sorry, just one sentence. Sure. Um, I think it's very possible that both parties could fracture. Um, mm -hmm. And I don't know which one is going to, but um, I would be very surprised if in 15 years we had a Democrat and a Republican party that look like the Democrat and Republican party we have now. Agreed. We have a, a question related to COVID and the generation that's really coming of age right now that we just talked about in, in the past in the past year and in the next few years, many young people have to delay entrance into university or participating or into the workforce or getting the job that they wanted. 
Can you comment on how you think that this will impact the ability for young leaders to develop the skills and experience they need to launch their careers and become leaders? You know, um, I think, again, that remains to be seen. I think there's certainly a lot of tragedy around this. And, you know, there's a lot of painful memory. You know, people have, are losing memories. They're not getting to go to their proms. They're not getting to build friendships. There's a lot of, um, there's, this is a tragic moment. Um, mm -hmm. This is a mass death moment in the United States. And that is deeply tragic. Um, I also think that historically in every moment of great adversity, uh, young people have found creative ways to, uh, to come out stronger. And I would be really surprised if that doesn't happen now. I don't think, I, I don't think that the generation that has you know, survived this or grown up through this is gonna come out feeble and, um, you know, inept and and is and kind of um, damaged because of what because of this national trauma that we've been through. I think that you know it could be that it maybe slows down the rat race a little bit. Um, I think millennials have really been through a serious rat race around college admission and get a job and blah, like, you know, the SATs, whatever. We are actually already seeing this with, um, I think I saw a couple of days ago, like the, the, co the college board changed the SATs and like made it more chill. Great, like more of that. Like just everyone needs to chill out a little bit. And if that is one, if that is a takeaway or an, an outcome of this pandemic of sort of, um, people maybe being a little bit more deliberate and purposeful with what they spend their time doing. I don't see how that's a bad thing. Fair enough. All right, one final question. Is there any damage caused by younger politicians trying to be too relatable? Dylan Sykes, the person asking the question particularly says, for example, AOC streams video games on Twitch. Is that a, a too far of a reach that might damage the millennial and young leader reputation? No. All right. <laughs> I think that the biggest mistake, um, I think that by far the biggest mistake anybody who is running for office makes is guarding themselves too much. Because uh, Donald Trump understood this more than anybody, um, the, especially in this media climate, people need meat. People just want to know stuff about you. So that's why AOC streaming on her Instagram, like eating black beans or whatever, um, is so much better than another member of Congress issuing a very, you know, uh, thoughtfully written press release about World Hunger Day. Like, mm -hmm. it's just so much more memorable. It's so much more personable. And in a and social media has made it so that people expect to uh, have some kind of personal understanding of mm -hmm. their leaders. And I think that um, millennials and Gen Z are really understanding that. Yeah, and you can't put a press release into a tweet, so <laughs> there's exactly. that. Well, Charlotte, I'd like to thank you for writing this book and for sharing your time and perspective with us today. We know that it's short-sighted to dismiss, dismiss any one generation or any one group of people, and that certainly includes the millennials, although they've been the butt of many jokes for a long time. I think they're tired of it and they're, they're taking action. This generation who's already on the present in the workforce is now winning these elections, forcing this change on both sides, right? It's not just one party or another. And they're speaking with a voice that's been informed by contemporary, very real challenges and change. As we started with, right, they've grown up with shootings in their schools, September 11th as a first critical memory on TV, watching those planes over and over. Long wars, digital immersion, multiple recessions, a pandemic, right? Hopefully once in a hundred years or less, but perhaps not. And greater connectivity to the world's problems, but also the world itself and to the world's solutions than any other generation before them. For those of you who haven't read it, Charlotte's book profiles their past, their paths that millennials have taken to power and their passions. And I highly recommend you give it you give it a read. It's sort of a story format where you get to know these leaders that we're seeing at Eat Black Beans on, on the internet and doing many other and carrying their guns into Congress too. All kinds of interesting things are happening on both sides. 
Please do join us at the World Affairs Council again in the future for upcoming programs. Next week on the 2nd, we'll hear from Augusto Lopez Claros on global governance and emerging institutions in the 21st century. How are we gonna to work together and do global institutions still matter? On February 11th, we'll take a deeper dive at the defense relationship with Canada, right? We don't often think about Canada with defense because they seem so nice. But in fact, we have a very deep and robust and critical defense relationship, which we'll hear more about when we host the defense attache to the United States, General Paul Ormsby on the 11th. Thank you again to our members and the young leaders and leaders of all ages joining us tonight and for Penn State Abington's partnership on this event. Good night.